Hey guys, what's going on? Today I'll be doing the character Hamlet uh, from the play Hamlet by William Shakespeare. So, uh, who is really Hamlet? What I'm gonna do is I plan to go scene by scene, perhaps, and talk about this character in detail. And I hope you guys enjoy and learn something new. So, in terms of Hamlet, uh, in Act 1, Scene 2, this is where he shows up first in terms of being a very important character. Oh, by the way, he is very likely always asked about in terms of the leading cert or um, higher ordinary. So in Act 1, Scene 2, he listens while Claudius holds court. Hamlet is dressed in black because he's still mourning for his father, which is further symbolizing his um, sadness towards the death of old Hamlet, his father. Hamlet responds to Claudius' description of him as my cousin Hamlet and my son by remarking in an aside that he is a little more than kin and less than kind. And those are quotes that you are very much free to use while supporting your answers. Remember guys, especially if you're higher level English, which most of you are, you need to know that when you're writing down your answer, quoting, like supporting your answers will quote as well as your own analysis is very much appreciated and, and almost every time gets you a good grade. Hamlet uses wordplay here when he says a little more than kin and less than kind and he means that he is more than a mere relation, kin. And also that he does not feel kindly towards Claudius. Remember, he cannot tell him exactly how he feels in like plain conversation because he's talking to the king. Hamlet continues his wordplay when he answers Claudius' question about the clouds or depression that seem to surround him by saying he is too much the sun. Hamlet is punning on the word son used by Claudius a short time ago and Hamlet does not want to be Claudius' son, of course. Neither does he want to be in the limelight. Now, finally, he is not in the mood for sunshine, of course. Why? Because he is mourning about the death of his father. Hamlet responds explosively to Gertrude when she asks why it seems as though he is the only one grieving and he objects to the word seems and says that he's sorrow is real and he says something in the words of seems madam or something and there's no seems like I only I only mourn truthfully he's left alone on stage um, and his anguish is clear as he wishes that he were dead and that God had not forbidden suicide and Hamlet sees life as meaningless and he says how weary stale flat and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of the world or this world the world in Hamlet's view is a rotten and corrupt place, much like a neglected garden. And he says, "'Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature, possess it merely." He complains or he compares Claudius unfavorably to old Hamlet. And he says about how uh, he, uh, like he is as much to Hercules as much as Claudius is to his father, as in how he's so excellent much of a king his father was. Hamlet remarks bitterly that despite the love between uh, his parents, his mother did not wait longer than a month before marrying Claudius and her behavior leads him to extend his disgust to all women and he says, frailty thy name is woman. Horatio enters with Marcellus and Bernardo and Hamlet is pleased to see his old friend Horatio and roused to excited curiosity by the story of the ghost that he, that of course um, revolves around the entire storyline of Hamlet. He questions Horatio and the other two men closely and expresses his desire to see the ghost for himself. He believes the ghost may have come to tell some foul play. Remember, he needs to understand if this ghost is real or just something sent from hell, a damned creature. So, in terms of the analysis of Act 1, Scene 2, he stands out as the only person in the court dressed in a knighted color, dark color. He contrasts with the other courtiers who have, to all intents and purposes, moved on from the death of the old king, and Hamlet refuses to pretend that all is well. And when his mother asks him why he seems to be still grieving, he replies, that's what I talked about earlier, Seems, madam, nay it is, I know, not seems. Hamlet's ready wit is shown when he answers Claudius with a wordplay using the words kin and son to make it clear he does not consider himself Claudius' son simply because of his mother's remarriage. 
Despite his sorrow at his father's death and his anger at his mother's hasty remarriage, Hamlet maintains enough self-control to hide the true depth of his feelings until he is alone and able to express himself in his first soliloquy. So through his soliloquy, we learn that Hamlet is in a very much depressive state and he has lost his faith in the world and sees little point in living. He wishes that God hadn't forbidden suicide and he says, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thou and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God, now weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Now, some critiques believe that these six lines give an important insight into Hamlet's procrastination and his descent into madness. If he truly believes the world to be so intolerable, then it is not surprising that he should find it so difficult to steer himself to act in terms of, you know, avenging his father's death, for instance. Um, what would be the point in going on in a pointless world? That's the, like, if I'm living for no reason, why do I avenge my dad? Hamlet's love for his father is clear in this scene, and I'm talking about Act 1, Scene 2. Um, he describes old Hamlet in his soliloquy, so excellent a king, and he tells Horatio that he shall not look upon his like again, that I am not going to live to see someone as great as my father, in terms of a king or a human being, for instance. Um, he also says that he has seen him in his mind's eye, yet it seems as though Hamlet feels inferior to his late father. He says Claudius is like King Hamlet as he, Hamlet, is like Hercules. This is what I was talking about a little bit earlier. And the late king was a warrior. His ghost appears in full armor, but his son does not believe that he shares his father's physical courage the way he looks like. Hence, his disparaging remarks about himself in comparison to Hercules. Now, for when it comes to Act uh, 1, Scene 4, Hamlet's uh, disgust at his uncle's resurrection of the old habit of firing off cannons. Remember at the beginning how he, how we overhear cannons being fired to signal drunken partying. This shows his moral superiority. Unlike Claudius, he has no time for such swinish behavior. And he is ha unhappy that other countries may view the Danes as weak drunkards because of this one tradition of firing cannons when you're drunk. And Hamlet's concern for Denmark's reputation shows his royal blood and his potential to rule. Now, this incident also serves to show the contrast between an uncle and his nephew. While Hamlet is engaged in a serious quest, Claudius and is drinking and making merry. Very much different to his father as well. Um... Now, Hamlet's philosophical reflection that a single flaw may damn a man or a nation is important, and many critics see a tragic hero as having one tragic flaw that brings about their downfall. And Hamlet may subconsciously be analyzing himself at the same time as he analyzes his country. Hamlet shows courage in following the ghost. Despite risking his life, he still follows it, despite Horatio and Marcello's warnings. However, his lack of fear now may also be attributed to his desperate state of finding out what happened and the lack of value he places on his own life. Remember, he wishes to die and he wishes that God hadn't forbidden sinning in terms of sinning as in killing oneself. Hamlet is unsure of the ghost motives and does not know if it's good or evil. And although he decides to address it as if it were his late father, Hamlet's doubts about the ghosts remain throughout the play. And the next thing in Act 1, Scene 5, Hamlet appears bent on avenging his father's murder. But there are some hints he may not actually sweep to his revenge. And he says, with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love. Now, ironically, for one who claims thought with deed, uh, or thought and deed, will be as one, Hamlet delays over and over as the play progresses, meditating on the ghost's words and his duty. He wants to make sure if this ghost is real and if it's telling the truth or not. Hamlet is more a scholar and a philosopher rather than a man suited to seek immediate and bloody revenge. He plans out more clearly before taking action. And this is evident throughout the entire scene and the entire play itself. Um, it is seen in his reaching for his notebook rather than his sword. And he says, my tables, 
Meat it is, I set it down, I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. He's talking about Claudius in this sense. Now Hamlet is in a highly agitated state of mind after his encounter with the ghost. This is hardly surprising given his despair before the encounter, his horror on hearing the dreadful details of his father's murder, the way the ghost told him about what Claudius has done, pouring poison into his ear and all that, and the burden of the duty the ghost has laid upon him, avenge me, of course, if the ghost is really his father. Although the ghost's visit may initially appear to give Hamlet a sense of purpose, the prince is overwhelmed by the responsibility. He believes the world is out of joint and does not believe he is the right person to set it right because he himself is screwed up. It is not clear why Hamlet decides to feign madness because this is one of the main questions in the Leaving Cert in uh, historically speaking and in the future. The question of uh, is it real or Hamlet's madness, is it real or is he merely acting or is it just something that he's doing to distract other people's attention. Um, now, his reaction to the ghost speaking from under the ground is strange and oddly inappropriate if he believes the spirit to be that of his dead father. Now, in terms of Act 2, Scene 1, um, Hamlet's behavior is difficult to interpret here, not least because we do not see him but must rely on Ophelia's account. He may be pretending to be mad and acting this way in front of Ophelia because he knows that she will report his behavior to Polonius. So he is a smart person who thinks things through before acting, not a person that will reach for his sword rather than uses, like he uses his mind rather. Now on the other hand, Hamlet may genuinely uh, be distressed because Ophelia, acting on her father's orders, has rejected him and left him more isolated and unhappy than before. Polonius believes Hamlet is mad and displacing the very ecstasy of love. He rushes to tell Claudius the news of his nephew's state of mind. If Hamlet is pretending to be mad in this scene, it is difficult to know what he hopes to gain from it. Okay? Um, in the next scene, in Act 2, Scene 2, um, although Polonius believes Hamlet is mad, there is nothing or there is a meaning behind the prince's words calling Polonius a fishmonger. Maybe a veiled reference to Polonius fishing for secrets or it may be a reference to the Elizabethan slang word for pimp. Alright, so he's dissing Polonius in a very much um, how I want to say this, uh, coded manner, all right? Uh, now, Hamlet may suspect Polonius of planning to use Ophelia as bait, and similarly, uh, Hamlet's comment about the sun breeding maggots in a dead dog can be seen as a reflection of his disgust at sexuality, because it links death and sex, all right? Dead dog and maggots breeding. Think about that, that's very detailed for symbolism and deeper true meaning. Um, now Hamlet asks if Polonius has a daughter, saying let her not walk in the sun, and there are layers of meaning to Hamlet's warning. Now if Ophelia is placed at the center of events, Polonius will use her to spy on Hamlet in the next scene, of course you'd have to remember that. Now harm may come to her if she is used for the sake of spying on Hamlet. After all, the Danish court is a corrupt and rotten place. Now Hamlet is also the son of a king and the son is an emblem of royalty, so the young prince could be warning Polonius to keep her away from him. This is again a codified way of Hamlet speaking about po to Polonius. Hamlet is a good judge of character. It appears that he suspects Polonius of planning to use Ophelia to spy on him and he knows Rosencrantz and Guildenstern were sent to do the same. Hamlet is deeply disillusioned with life, telling Polonius he would be happy for his life to be taken from him and admitting to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern that he is depressed and sees no point in living. Now, Hamlet's wit and dark humor in this scene, as he toys with Polonius and Rosencrantz as well as Guildenstern, suggests he is sane as he as does his comment about being mad north northwest. His interaction with the players reveals Hamlet's intelligence and learning. He sh shows how Hamlet is very much educated about the uh, world of uh, drama and the world of theater. 
Not only does he know the speeches well enough to deliver them himself, but he is able to write an additional speech for the murder of Gonzago, that the, the play he uses, the mousetrap, to catch the flaw of Claudius and to confirm that he is the killer. In his soliloquy, Hamlet rails against in action, against his inaction and examines the reasons for it. Now, it appears that the players have revived his desire for revenge as he expresses his rage at his own inadequacy. inadequacy sorry. However, he procrastinates once again, saying that he fears the ghost may be a devil and that it is not a reliable proof of Claudius' guilt. Therefore, he hatches his plot to catch the conscience of the king. This is a very long scene, but very little happens, although much is discussed. This is an apt reflection of Hamlet's reliance on words rather than actions, and merely I'm talking about this specific scene. Now, in Act 3, when we shift to Act 3, Scene 1, Hamlet discusses, although he discusses suicide as an option, he treats it as a general philosophical idea rather than something he has seriously considered for himself. He's a typical Renaissance intellectual, not particularly interested in action, but deeply interested in the human condition. Hamlet meditates on the nature of meditation, and his conscience prevents him from taking swift against or swift action against Claudius. He vents his anger and disgust to Ophelia, and Hamlet's cruelty in this scene is open to a number of interpretations. Now, he is so revolted by his mother's hasty remarriage to Claudius that he sees all women's sexuality as a cheap and dirty trick to lure men and then betray them. And he is unable to put his mother's behavior in perspective and condemns all the behavior of women instead. Um, he may be genuinely hurt and angry by Ophelia's rejection, and after all, he came to her room in a state of agitation, but he, she has not relented and wants to return his gifts to her, alright? Uh, Hamlet may be aware that he is being spied upon and his words may be intended for Claudius and Polonius as well as for Ophelia, and he refers to both Claudius and Polonius, calling the latter a fool and hinting at a threat to the former. And he says, I say we will have no more marriages, those that are married already, but all but one shall live. If he does suspect he's being spied upon, Hamlet is likely to feel doubtly betrayed by Ophelia for conspiring against him. And Hamlet's love in Act 3, Scene 2, Hamlet's love of the theatre, his knowledge of acting and his ability to speak sanely and intelligently are clear, further evidence that he is pretending to be mad the entire time rather than being truthfully mad or really mad. Hamlet's conversation with Horatio is clever and coherent, reinforcing the idea that he is rational, he deeply admires his friend and envies him with his self-control. Um, Hamlet snubs his mother and sits instead with Ophelia. Although he insults her, his cruelty and sarcasm foreshadow the way he will speak to his mother when they are next alone together. Now, his attitude to women is bitter and negative. Hamlet's response to what he believes is proof on Claudius' guilt shows that he can be violent and ruthless. He wants revenge on Claudius and seems to be poisoned to kill his uncle, but knows he must first exercise some self-control and restrain from hurting his mother, even though he clearly believes that she deserves to be punished. In Act 3, Scene 3, quite short of a scene, critiques defer over Hamlet's decision not to kill Claudius, and Hamlet says he does not do so because he feels it is unfair for his uncle to go to heaven, which an Elizabethan audience would have understood. Now, you always have to keep in mind that this play is not nowadays' play, it was a, like, it, like, it took place at that time, Elizabethan era, Shakespearean times. After all, True revenge means eternal damnation. I don't want to kill you when you're praying because if that means you going to heaven, I don't really get my revenge. So you get to your goal faster. I want you to be damned in hell for the rest of your life and afterlife. And that's what Hamlet is thinking about. Now, um, some believe that this is merely another excuse to avoid taking decisive action, not killing him while he is praying. Others says that it is like Hamlet's sense of fairness that prevents him from murdering an unarmed man, for instance. 
The choice is up to you, you can use whatever argument you want to. And there's of course a terrible irony in Hamlet's decision. Although he does not know it, Claudius is not in a state of grace at all because he cannot repent. He is sitting on the floor on his knees trying to repent. He can't, but Hamlet doesn't know. So Hamlet doesn't want to kill Claudius because he's praying. Meanwhile, Claudius isn't praying. And this is the irony that comes into play at the moment. Now in Act 3, Scene 4, um, Hamlet is furious with his mother in the scene and he confronts her about her marriage. And this is the only time in the play that they are alone together. This scene is a reversal of the normal parent-child relationship. Hamlet controls the conversation and tries to find out if Gertrude knew about her late husband's murder. Now Gertrude appears to be shocked by Hamlet's claim and by his attack on her, wringing her hands and begging her son to speak no more. And Hamlet is determined to save his mother's soul. He talks to her much as a priest might talk to a sinner, urging her for the love of grace not to sin anymore and to assume a virtue if you have it not. These are quotes that I'm talking about right now. The tone of Hamlet's speech to his mother hints that he believes himself to be superior to her. He asks her to forgive his preaching, but immediately says, for in the fatness of these Percy times, virtue itself of vice must pardon beg. It seems to Hamlet that he is a good person who, in these sinful times, must ask sinners, as his mother, to allow him to help them. Now, Hamlet's love for his father is very clear. He idolizes the late king, comparing him to Hyperion, Jove, Mars, and Mercury. When the ghost appears, Hamlet is deeply moved by his appearance and the reason for his visitation. And it is said, and I, and I quote, his form and cause and cause conjoined preaching to stones would make them capable. Now, Hamlet killing Polonius is a hugely significant moment in the play, very important that you can always be asked about. You can even use it for your own. I mean, I actually suggest that you use it if you can, because it will lead to the madness and death of Ophelia and the vengeful return of Laertes, which kill, who kills the main character, Hamlet. Now, ultimately, it will be this single impulsive murder that will lead to the death of many of the other characters in the play as well. That's why it's a very important act and a very important moment in the play. Through this spontaneous violent act, Hamlet has sealed his own fate. The murder of Polonius raises questions about Hamlet's morality. He does not regret the deed and insults the old man, even in death. And it also shows that Hamlet is capable of acting decisively, now in contrast to what happened a few scenes ago. Um, now, the murder of Polonius, and after that what happens is that he can only carry, uh, carry out the rash and bloody deed, and it's a quote, because it is on the spore of the moment, and in the prayer scene, Hamlet had time to stop and think. The murder lends credence to, sh to those who claim Hamlet is genuinely mad, and there's no logic behind his belief that Claudius is hiding behind the arras, and his reaction to the murder is extremely odd, killing Polonius or thinking that it is, you know, merely Claudius there, maybe I could just do it and get away with, get it over with right, right now. In Act 4, Scene 2, Hamlet is far too clever for Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and Rosencrantz says, I understand you not, my lord, and Hamlet replies that he is glad of it. And there is some dark humor in Hamlet's behavior in this scene, which audiences like enjoy his contemptuous outwitting of the disloyal pair. Remember that Hamlet has the ability to uh, engage in a battle of wits. If you get the reference, that'll be great. If you don't, look it up without really witting you directly. Uh, the final moments of the scene in which Hamlet acts like a haunted fox and runs away, living up an otherwise dark moment. Polonius may have been a fool, but he did not deserve to be murdered and have his corpse hidden away. This is complete, completely unrighteous, sinful, and against all the beliefs of Christianity, because everyone who is a Christian uh, deserves to have proper burial. Hamlet's answers in Act 4, Scene 3 to Claudius' questions are not simply nonsensical. He demonstrates his keen wit, relieves the tension of the section of the play by using dark humor, and makes philosophical observations on the nature of death. 
And Hamlet's contempt for Claudius is clear. He insults the king by implying that he will go to hell and humiliates him by saying he may eventually go a progress through the guts of a beggar. And this is a quote. Hamlet reveals that he suspects Claudius' reason for sending him to England. And in Act 4, Scene 4, Hamlet seems more serious, reflective, and less angry than he was in the previous scenes. His soliloquy is reminiscent of that in Act 2, Scene 2, in which he berated himself for not being able to show as much emotion as the players, and said that rather than act, he tends to, like a whore, unpack my heart with words. This is a very important quote that you can use. Despite his self-criticism and his seeming determination, Hamlet swears his thoughts will be bloody rather than his deeds. Now, shifting to the final act, the most important, well, not the most important, but like really important act of this play, Hamlet, in scene one of act five, reflects that everyone, no matter how important they may have been in life, is merely reduced to bones that can be thrown around the graveyard by men such as gravediggers. The gravedigger foreshadows Hamlet's imminent death by remarking that he has been digging graves since Hamlet was born. This is very important. The gravedigger does not care about social class, nor does he recognize the living prince in front of him. And this reinforces the idea that Hamlet will soon be another anonymous set of bones in the graveyard. I hope you get why I'm saying this. Now, Hamlet's reflections on Yorick, and there's a whole story story about Yorick's uh, skull and Hamlet and how they are, were associated when Hamlet was a kid, as well as Alexander the Great, can be seen as reflections on his own death. Now Hamlet resembles both in a way, he is a prince and a man who loves to make witty jokes, yet he too will come to dust. And Hamlet may also be thinking of his father, whose greatness he has praised so lavishly in previous acts. From, the, from this point on, there is little mention of the dead king. Now, has Hamlet achieved some perspective on his father's importance or not? Now, Hamlet claims the title of Hamlet the Dane, and this is significant as it shows he sees himself as the rightful king. Hamlet's behavior at Ophelia's graveside can be interpreted in a, in a number of ways, which are, now number one, he's generally distraught and he's telling the truth when he says, I love Ophelia, 40,000 brothers could not, with all their quantity of love, make up my sum. Number two, he is disgusted by Laertes' behavior and wants to show him up by proving how ridiculous and tasteless Laertes' extravagant shows of grief are. In the next act, Hamlet tells Laertes that the bravery or showiness and his theory of Laertes' grief sent him. Hamlet into a towering passion. And number three, he is jealous of Laertes and wants to regain the limelight himself. He asks Laertes, Dost thou come here to whine to outface me with leaping in her grave? Uh, ha number four, Hamlet is so self-absorbed that he cannot accept that Laertes has an equal or greater right to grief. He appears aggravated or aggrieved that Laertes is angry with him, even though Laertes has every right to be. Hamlet mistreated Ophelia, murdered Polonius, and disrupted this funeral. So all these three reasons contribute to why um, Laertes has an issue with Hamlet. He is mad, number five. Claudius and Gertrude say he is, but it suits them both to claim that. Now, Claudius wants to stop Laertes from fighting Hamlet until he can be sure Laertes will win, and Gertrude wants to excuse her son's behavior. So, in Act 5, Scene 2, Hamlet's plot to have Rosencrantz and Guildenstern killed in his place shows that he has a ruthless side. He feels no pity for his old school friends, saying, they are not near my conscience. And Hamlet appears to believe that everything that is happening to him is his destiny. He was able to forge the letter of execution on the ship because he happened to have his father's royal ring on him to imprint a seal on the wax. And he says, why even in that was heaven ordinant? He also accepts the inevitability uh, of death and faces it calmly. Now, Hamlet's killing of Claudius supports the idea of chance taking a hand. It is not planned. Hamlet merely seizes the opportunity when it arises, and Hamlet dies well. 
reconciled with Laertes and ensuring that Denmark is left in the hands of a capable ruler. Fortinbras comments on his friend's nobility in the final speech of the play and he says he was likely had he been put on to have proved, proved most loyal or most royal. Anyway guys, these are merely the analysis of Hamlet's character throughout the scenes. Now, anyway guys, these are merely the uh, points that I want to talk about for when it comes to Hamlet, who he is and what really happens in the play. However, I really suggest that you guys look up uh, a scene by scene, like the moment I talk about Act 1, Scene 1, reread Act 1, Scene 1, even a summary would do, and then listen to my recording. Pause it, read Act 1, Scene 2, then listen to then further listen to my recording and this is the best technique to get to this so like if you have already listened to this video and watched it uh maybe you would want to do this again by trying the technique that i just told you about i hope it works out thank you very much for being here and see you next time